thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, it's wonderful to see such great turnout as we predicted. This is a topic that is of interest, I think, to many people who are watching live and who will also be watching this recording. Um, as a reminder, I am Rachel Justice and along um, with Jillian Levinson, my co-leader uh, in Woman to Woman and Carly Abramson, who uh, is not with us today. This is our Thursday um, general support group with wonderful guest speakers. Um, and we have a really, really exciting topic today. Um, I'm gonna read you the um, bio for Jill Meyer Lippert. So Jill Meyer Lippert, RDH, is a registered dental hygienist who took special interest in the oral care and concerns of cancer survivors early in her career when her mom was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1992. Jill earned her certificate in oncology management from the University of Southern Indiana and is a 2014 recipient of the Sunstar America's RDH Award of Distinctions. Congratulations, Jill. Um, she serves as a regional coordinator for the Oral Cancer Foundation and is a regular contributor for the Anti-Cancer Club. In 2013, Jill launched her business, Side Effect Support LLC, which is dedicated to helping cancer survivors to manage or prevent short-term oral side effects and long-term damage to oral health associated with chemotherapy and other cancer therapies. So we are absolutely thrilled to have Jill joining us today. I was explaining to her beforehand that uh, Carly and I knew this was a topic that would be of interest to our patients, but we didn't have any idea who we could ask. And we Googled and thankfully Google worked for us and Jill came up and we cold approached her. We wrote an email together, which uh, Carly sent, and we are so thrilled that she said yes and agreed to share her expertise and um, experience with us today. So Jill, thank you so much. Uh, Lal is in your court. You have the, the mic, so to speak. And um, if you could just let everyone know how you'd like them to handle questions, because um, that, you know, again, some speakers prefer people put them in the chat. Some people want to use the hand raising. Some people like the traditional waving. Some people want them to wait until the end. So. Um, if it's okay, I will, I'll do, I'll share a PowerPoint. And I know sometimes in the chat that can be a little um, tricky with, with retrieving the questions when the PowerPoint is going. Um, so if it's okay, if we have a little discussion at the end, it might be easier to um, go back and forth with some of the questions then. So uh, I, and I can also help you so I can kind of scroll through any chat. Oh, okay. Not yeah. just... Whatever works best really. Cause I know sometimes when I have questions, if I wait till the end, when I'm, I'm a participant, I might forget them. So feel free if that was what works best for anybody. <laughs> so I'll see if I can share my screen here. Thank you for having me today. As Rachel mentioned, my name is Jill Meyer Lippert and I'm the founder um, of an online resource called Side Effect Support. And the whole purpose of Side Effect Support is to address the oral health concerns that can occur after a cancer diagnosis. And my inspiration for this is my mom. Uh, when I started my very first job in the dental field as a dental assistant uh, in June of 1992, she received her breast cancer diagnosis and she suffered horribly with um, side effects from her chemotherapy where her mouth was so dry, she would actually feel like she was choking at times from her tissue sticking together. Um, and she had these horrible mouth sores. And when she approached her oncology team to say, you know, I am I'm in so much pain, I'm miserable, I can't sleep, it's hard to eat, you know, what can I do? Uh, she was told nothing. It was just part of treatments and she needed to deal with that. And I found that really difficult to accept. And I very foolishly thought that now that I worked in the dental field, I'd be able to easily find these answers for her. And it was a rude awakening to find out that most dental professionals didn't know what to do either. So I really um, had a mission to learn more, to try to even though I might not be able to help my mom at that time, I might be able to help somebody. Uh, so it really started out by questioning patients in the practice where I worked, where everybody who came in with cancer on their medical history, I viewed as an opportunity to learn from. And I would question them, what kind of cancer did you have? What kind of treatments did you have? Uh, what did you find that did or didn't happen? And it didn't take long that I started to notice some patterns where not everybody had problems inside of their mouth, but a lot of people did report that they did. Um, for those who did, very few felt that they were provided um, adequate information of what they um, could expect during the process. And even fewer felt uh, reported that they felt that they were provided any type of guidance of what they could do to possibly prevent or manage the issues. Um, and what I found most surprising is how many people came through their treatments 
only to have a lot of damage occurred to their oral health. Um, so they just went from the situation of all this time and money and stress in an oncology setting, and they pretty much transferred it into a dental setting. And sometimes people were dealing with these issues many, many years after their treatments were complete. So um, fast forward many years later, my, my father actually um, ended up with cancer. And after that experience, I decided I really wanted to make something good come out of these bad experiences. And I started a volunteer program at our local oncology clinic where my, my dad received treatments where I created basically little goodie bags where everybody who came in for treatments received um, a real simple information of problems that could occur with um, tips of things that they could do to possibly prevent or manage the problems. And then a selection of um, product samples that they could take home and start using right away. And I kept that going from about 2006 till about 2010, all of a sudden companies were beginning uh, to be less generous with their samples and the kits were getting smaller and smaller. And finally, by 2012, I realized I needed to either um, discontinue the program, which the thought of that really did break my heart, or I could try to um, change course and make something bigger out of it and expand the reach. And that is how the idea of side effect support came about. So just to show you, this is the homepage that if you do go on the website, just to help you navigate a little bit on that top bar, you'll see that there is a blog section. And that is actually split into two um, two areas that there are free informational articles for survivors and their family caregivers that are more layman's terms. And you can actually search for topics um, in a filter by bar. There's also a um, section for healthcare providers to help get medical and dental professionals more on the same page, because this sadly is an area that there isn't a lot of information for us as healthcare providers um, always readily available to. Uh, there's also a resources tab. And if you go under the resources, um, you can actually print for free. Also, I have a, um, a patient brochure uh, called Cancer Treatments and Oral Health that again, these go in the little goodie bags that I've got um, and just for general information. And you can print that for free too that gives some helpful tips and ideas of problems that can occur. Um, so we'll go into, you know, what what is oral health versus oral disease. And there's a lot of things that determine um, one person having problems in their mouth compared to the next person. And part of that is genetics. Um, some people just like anything are going to be more susceptible. And some of that is actually the bacterial makeup inside of the mouth. They're finding that um, you know, a mom that has a lot of dental um, cavities, a lot of dental disease, their children are going to be much more likely to experience problems too, because you can actually pass that bacteria from one person to the next. Um, it can be influenced by other medical conditions and medications. Uh, there are just a ton of medications out um, on the market versus they can be over the counter or prescription that have side effects inside of the mouth, like dry mouth is a real common one. Um, oral hygiene plays a big part, uh, diet and lifestyle um, choices and habits like a heavy soda drinker, um, smoking, um, drinking alcohol, and uh, professional dental care and access to that. So our, our bodies are made up of bacteria. Um, that's just how we're made as humans. And our mouth is no exception to that. We have tons of bacteria in our mouth. And we have uh, good bacteria that we need uh, to maintain oral health. And we have bad bacteria that cause cavities and gum disease and infections. And Truly, the, the clue to having a healthy mouth is to have the good bacteria outnumber the bad. And there's uh, certain strategies that we can do to help make that happen. And it, to get a cavity, you need a combination of a few things. You need, obviously, the tooth. Um, you need the bad bacteria. And you need uh, sugar. So the bad bacteria actually eat sugar. So if we have soda, we have uh, sugary foods, anything that's considered a fermentable carbohydrate, the bacteria in our mouth can actually eat that. And then just as when we eat, we form a waste, uh, the bacteria form a waste and that they form is acid. And when that acid um, is expressed and bathes over the tooth, that is actually what causes a cavity. So you need those combinations in order to get a cavity. So if you look at 
the anatomy of a tooth. There's kind of a, a goofy analogy of comparing a tooth to a peanut M&M, but it's a good visualization where your hard candy <laughs> on the outside is your enamel, and that's the hardest shell um, that protects the outside of the tooth. And on the inside of that, you have a softer layer, which would be your softer chocolate called uh, the dentin. And that is um, underneath the enamel and the peanut in the middle is considered your pulp chamber. And that is the middle part where all of the nerves and the blood vessels end up to the root um, and are encased in the tooth. And that's what actually gives the tooth life because a tooth actually is considered alive. So the goal is if you would start getting a cavity, you wanna catch it as early as possible when it's in that outside hard enamel layer. Because if it gets through that enamel layer and gets into that softer inside dentin layer, that's when it can start moving really fast. And if it gets into the inside pulp chamber where the nerves and the blood vessels are, that is when the tooth either needs a root canal uh, where they actually drill down through the top of the tooth and they remove all the nerves and blood vessels and kind of fill up that chamber, or the tooth needs to be extracted. And those are really only uh, the options in those cases. Uh, so we definitely don't want a cavity to ever get into those inside layers and to just catch everything as early as possible. And this is an excellent doing that. So if you look at where the arrows are and you see those little um, dark triangles, that is actually a cavity that is going through the enamel and then getting into the, the dentin area. So you can see the important tube. By the time that this can happen, uh, we can catch things a lot earlier on x-rays than we can by seeing it with our eyes. Uh, we're also um, wanting to talk about gum disease. So when you go to the dentist, um, typically what they would do probably is they take one of these little um, rulers called a periodontal probe, and they basically dance it around the tooth. It's a lot like uh, if I would put it between my fingernail and my finger. Your gum tissue and your tooth are not attached all the way up to the top. There's a natural space in there. So when that goes underneath the, the gum line, uh, we go until we feel that resistance where they're attached together. And then there are stripes on there where we can gauge how far did that drop underneath the gum line. And a healthy range is considered about three millimeters or less. And if you start getting deep, it's either showing, um, it's either showing that there's inflammation of the tissue because of the puffiness of the tissue will rise up deeper on the probe or it's showing signs of um, periodontal disease where the little ligaments that attach the gum tissue to the tooth are starting to separate away. And as that separates away, it's really easy to get into a snowball effect because the deeper your pocket is, the harder it is for you to get in there with brushing or flossing to get that cleaned out. But the bacteria now can harbor down into that pocket and keep attacking at that attachment. Um, if it, the gum tissue gets irritated enough, eventually the bone can start to recede back. And that is one of the main reasons that people lose teeth as they get older, they just lose that bone support around their teeth. So oral health has actually been connected to a lot of different um, medical issues and they have connected um, oral health to cardiovascular disease, to strokes, um, to actually erectile dysfunction. And the thought process is that um, that is when it's actually um, sometimes a precursor to the heart attacks and problems like that because it's attack attacking those little fine vasculatures um, beforehand, kind of early in the stages. They've made um, connections now to Alzheimer's disease where they have actually found certain bacteria from the mouth in, in the brain. Uh, there are problems with diabetes where somebody who's diabetic is more susceptible to oral health problems. And the more oral health problems you have, it actually is harder to keep your blood sugar levels under control. So there's a very reciprocal effect with that. They have actually linked um, certain types of oral bacteria to certain types of cancers too. Uh, they can find certain oral bacteria in different types of um, colon cancers, in different types of esophageal cancers. Uh, so they're, they're very much at the cusp of learning uh, what we can do with this information. So it's it's exciting to know that um, now that they're making these connections, it's going to open up opportunities as time goes on for ways that we can possibly prevent or treat um, some of these issues. So 
there are some um, hospital systems and some care facilities that are really taking note in the importance of um, oral health in the quality of life and care for their for their patients. And I'm just I have a couple just that I'm highlighting here. And this is at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, I believe it's in Florida where they implement oral care bundles, kind of similar to the, the program that I had. And they had the nurses lead, um, monitor the patients that they were brushing their teeth and using lip balm twice a day and uh, rinsing their mouth three times a day. And their compliance rate was about 60%, which is impressive with little kids because it's hard enough to get kids to uh, brush their teeth when they are feeling well. But just through that simple program, by educating the parents, by giving them the products and monitoring um, this, the process, they had a 50% reduction in infections inside of the mouth while kids were going through treatment. And that meant that kids were going home sooner from the hospital. Um, there were fewer kids being readmitted. There are fewer kids going to the ICU with infections. Um, and in Virginia, there are some uh, programs where they've actually found that by implementing real simple um, toothbrushing techniques with uh, some of the patients, and having the nurses monitor it, they are drastically cutting their um, cases of hospital acquired pneumonia. And hospital acquired pneumonia is one of the most common um, infections that send our patients to um, the ICU and end up with having patients readmitted. And it's a, a huge cost uh, financially for the patients, for the hospital, um, but they're saving um, lives. They're saving a lot of lives in the process too. So even though that we know that uh, the bacteria in the side of the mouth can cause infections, not only in the mouth, but respiratory infections um, and cause complications with treatments, the unfortunate re reality is, um, especially in long-term care facilities, it is something that just falls by the wayside. Uh, there's, they have a lot on their plate. Fortunately, this, this is something that isn't always addressed for our patients. So these are just some of the oral side effects that can occur um, during cancer treatments. And obviously we're not gonna go through all of these, but I will focus more um, really on the top two, the dry mouth, because uh, that is one of the most common that we'll see. And also the oral mucositis, which is the um, inflammation and sometimes the, um, the ulcerations, the mouth sores that can occur during treatments. So the biggest thing with dry mouth is really to keep in mind that our saliva is amazing. And that is one of these situations where when they talk about um, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. Uh, anybody who has experienced severe dry mouth can attest to you that they probably had no idea how life altering that it can be. Uh, so our saliva is made up of all of these real, uh, these natural elements that are really beneficial as far as helping with uh, lubricating the tissue to prevent wounds. But if a wound would occur, it helps with wound healing. And that, that old um, saying where they talk about licking your wounds, that's actually where that comes from because our saliva has some benefits for with wound healing. Uh, it has antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral properties. Um, it helps with um, buffering your oral pH. So uh, if you, and we're gonna go through acidity in a little bit and that'll make more sense, but it helps to keep healthy pH level inside of your mouth. Um, and that plays a role with tooth remineralization. And that'll make more sense in a couple slides here too. And it's our first uh, step in food digestion. And one thing to keep in mind too, I'm gonna add to this list is taste. We have certain taste buds on our tongue that are dependent on saliva to function properly. So the drier your mouth is, the more likely that you will have taste alterations, which is also a real common complaint during treatments. Uh, for some people, um, depending on the type of treatments you have and the medications that, uh, that you have, it may be a very temporary issue. Um, for other people, it can be a very long-term issue, especially people that have experienced any type of radiation to the head and neck. Uh, their salivary glands can be so damaged that their saliva never quite returns uh, to a normal state. I did notice, Rachel, that someone's waiting in the waiting room. Did I... Um, is that okay? Okay. Um, so I just want to, I came back to that other slide and I changed the color of all of the issues that we can, it hopefully help in some way, simply by addressing dry mouth. 
Uh, so if we are treating dry mouth, we can help to reduce the, the risk of the inflammation and ulcerations of the tissue. We're gonna help prevent uh, cavities and gum disease, enamel erosions, all sorts of infections, taste changes, trouble swallowing. And even these other two, the osteonecrosis of the jaw and the graft versus host disease, those are, are rare conditions, but they can be pretty serious conditions. Oh, and I should say the osteonecrosis is rare. Graft versus host is going to be more with your bone marrow transplant patients. So it's something that you're not going to see in all different types of treatments. But even in those really complex problems, treating the dry mouth can make a huge difference in helping to prevent the problems or manage them. So some really simple dry mouth strategies are obviously to stay hydrated, really uh, pushing a lot of water, kind of flushing some of those medications through your system um, and just watching as far as what you're, what you're drinking and eating, um, you know, avoiding the caffeine, tobacco, alcohol, because all of that can be really fine. Um, something as simple as breathing through your nose. Sometimes people um, may need just a little simple saline uh, rinse in their nose or a nasal wash or something like that to help maintain that ability to breathe well through their nose because you can do all these other strategies but if you're constantly breathing through your mouth um, it's going to get dry and we're not going to really be winning that battle there uh, when you're eating too using sauces and gravies you know really using moist foods and avoiding like eating dry crackers and things like that and also using a humidifier especially at night can help to make a difference too and then we could look at um, possibly modifying other medications that also cause dry mouth. Um, this is something obviously your, um, your doctor and your nurses need to really go through your full medication list. And that sometimes people are on, you know, several different medications and they may have um, two, three, four meds that each have dry mouth as a side effect. And if that's the case, it is just compounding and getting worse and worse with each time as a medication is added. So it is worth the conversation that if it's possible, you know, could one of those medications possibly be substituted for something else that maybe doesn't have that side effect? And that might not always be the case, uh, but it's worth worth the discussion. Uh, there, is pres there are prescription saliva stimulants or artificial saliva, um, and there are a ton of over-the-counter products. Um, this is something that I'm gonna spend a little, probably the vast majority of the time I'm talking about products because that's the simplest thing that we can do. And I think you're gonna be surprised that um, sometimes what is available to you might not always be the best choices, unfortunately. Uh, the biggest thing I could say though is, uh, avoid cough drops. That is one thing I saw a lot um, in the dental practice that people would feel like um, now that my mouth is dry, I feel like I get that little tickle in my throat and they would suck on cough drops. And that is a recipe for disaster as far as causing damage to your teeth because a lot of cough drops um, are sugary. And even if you have sugar-free cough drops, a lot of them are acidic. Um, so sometimes you're cutting out that middleman of creating the acid and they're just putting the acid right, <laughs> right inside of your mouth. So it ends up causing a lot of problems with, um, with cavities. Um, and as far as oral mucositis, that again is the inflammation or ulcerations of, of the gum tissue or the oral mucosa um, in the cheeks. And that is something that about 40% or so of people going through standard dose chemotherapy, uh, they think about um, 75, 80% of people going through bone marrow transplants, which I think actually might be kind of low, and um, nearly 100% of people that have radi or radiation to the head and neck. And oral mucositis is considered, uh, they call it like a major toxicity of cancer treatments. It's, it's one of the main reasons that people have to alter or delay their treatments uh, because of pain or because of not being able to eat properly or because of infection risks. So um, once especially with chemotherapy. And I'm sure you all know this all too well. Uh, a lot of times chemo is a very much like a roller coaster. You have your infusion and then your blood counts drop. You have all the, the side effects that come with it. And then you start to rebound and you're feeling better. And usually right about the time you're feeling better is right when you're time to go back in for your next treatment and you go through it all again. So if oral mucositis occurs at one of those, um, one of those cycles, each time that you have it, you're more likely to have it happen again, and you're more likely to have it more severe each time. So that's where the, the benefit is, is if we know that oral mucositis is a risk for treatments, 
is to start making changes even before it has a chance to occur. Um, and that way we can hopefully help to delay the onset of it happening um, or help to minimize the severity of it because we don't want it to get, keep getting worse each time. So that is why um, really the main goal is to look at at prevention when it comes to oral mucositis. Once it occurs, then we get a little bit more limited on what we can do. Um, and not there are certain risk factors that make somebody more susceptible to getting oral mucositis too. So um, females are actually more likely to have problems than males are. Uh, there are uh, the extremes of ages. So the very young or the very old are gonna be more susceptible. Uh, the extremes of body mass index. So the very, very thin or very large are more susceptible. And also um, certain races uh, are more or less susceptible than others. So those things we can't really modify in any way. Um, so the things that we want to look at modifying are uh, the risk factors of having dry mouth, uh, making sure that we treat that before it has a chance of starting, um, any existing dental issues. And that is where there's true value of your dentist as early as possible in the treatment process. Uh, my, one of my, um, I, my battle cries, I guess would be the best way to say it, is that I would, in the ideal world, when somebody would receive a diagnosis, seeing a dentist um, before your treatment start, having that recommendation is, it would be so valuable. Um, make sure that there aren't any active cavities, there's no active infections, um, there's no food traps, you know, anything that can cause irritation to the tissue. And, and it might be something as simple as a, an area that catches food easy or an overhanging margin of a filling. Um, sometimes people that have dentures or partials may have a spot that rubs, you know, getting that, those adjustments to make sure that we're not having that constant irritation onto the gum tissue, um, and then providing them the information that they need to help themselves. And part of that is with poor oral hygiene. Um, for somebody that has a lot of dental plaque and buildup inside of their mouth, um, that is considered a higher bacterial burden and that actually starts that inflammatory process. So we can give modified instructions of the best way to keep the mouth as clean as possible. Um, if somebody goes into treatments with a really healthy mouth, they are much less likely to have problems. They're in no way immune to it, but it's something simple that we can do to help um, give ourselves the best chance to avoid issues. Uh, so then it really comes down to, to what can we do? Um, some of these issues are so complex and I think sometimes that's where it gets lost in the shuffle is because we all assume there's gotta be these really um, difficult answers too. So sometimes it's, it's just taking a step back, looking at the simple things that we can do um, to help make a difference. And part of that can be looking at your toothbrush. So if you look at that upper left-hand photo, I've got some examples here too. A lot of times when you go into, you know, I'll say a Walmart or a place like that, any place that you buy toothbrush, a lot of them are really big. I mean, I think so sometimes they're more of the size of a hairbrush than a toothbrush. Um, so we always want people to use an extra soft, compact head toothbrush. And sometimes even using a child size brush is a nice idea. Um, and the, the advantage of that is you're going to be um, much less likely to cause tissue trauma. Uh, having a large head like this makes it very difficult to reach into some of those really tight areas of the mouth. So it's gonna be harder to clean and you're gonna be much more likely to um, abrade the tissue or cause um, some trauma in some way. Uh, one trick is one of the areas that's hardest to reach is way up on the cheek side of these top last molars. And what you can do actually to help reach those is when you get the brush up into your cheek, if you open really wide, what happens is your jawbone moves forward and you actually end up hitting the jawbone before you get to that last tooth. So close down about halfway and whatever side you're trying to reach, shift your bottom jaw over to that side and that actually takes your jawbone back and out to the side and you should be able to swipe that toothbrush all the way around the back side of that last tooth and that's where that compact head is really going to help make a difference with that too. Another area is on the long side of the bottom molars along the gum line and you should be able to swipe that all the way around the back side there too. Um, 
replacing your toothbrush, you want to replace them at the first sign of bending or fraying of the bristles. As soon as they start bending or fraying like that top middle picture, you're not cleaning as well with them. Uh, when you're using an extra soft toothbrush, it's going to happen faster. Um, but try to get yourself in the mindset that when you're in treatments, replacing your brush um, more frequently is probably a good you don't want this to be a source for building up a lot of bacteria or anything on, especially if you have mouth sores. Um, and that was one thing too in the upper right-hand picture, how are you storing your brush? Um, a lot of people are storing their toothbrushes along with family members where they're all in a cup, they're in a drawer, they're touching each other. This is a potential transmission of bacteria, viruses from one family member to the next. Um, that is something that even putting them out on the cupboard um, counter around a flushing toilet, or um, there's a lot of things that can be floating around a bathroom. So you don't want those landing on your toothbrush and then using that in your mouth. Um, sometimes what people do too, is they'll have two toothbrushes. They'll let them dry. They'll let one dry out fully before they use the other one. And that helps that you're not constantly keeping those bristles wet. And that helps to reduce the bacterial buildup on them too. One way to protect them, um, you know, I've seen people that sometimes use those plastic travel caps. And if you look in that lower left hand picture, if anybody who's used those, um, you know how you get that little white film on the inside? That is considered a bacterial biofilm. You're basically um, encasing it in a little greenhouse of bacteria. <laughs> so I know, sorry if this is hard for anybody to listen to, but um, that is something that there is an option. There are now these little breathable covers. There's a little breathable fabric cover. It reduces um, transmission from airborne um, viruses, bacteria, whatever that are, are landing on it. And then also through cross-contamination with family members. So typically, even though it's, it, people don't like to think of these things, when your immune system's healthy, it's probably not that big of a deal. We're kind of built to, to fight that stuff off. But when you're in treatments, this is just one extra thing you can do to be on the safe side. Um, and then also looking at uh, using your own tube of toothpaste. Uh, I am guilty of this all the time. I put a toothpaste out on my brush. A lot of times I'll take the end of that tube and I will kind of um, rub it on the end of the bristles, make sure I get the rest off on there. Basically, the end of that toothpaste tube is now contaminated with whatever is on my toothbrush, and you can pass things along from one family member to the next there, too. So using your own brush during treatments or your own toothpaste uh, during treatments is something simple you can do, too. Uh, so flossing. Uh, you wouldn't think anything like flossing would be controversial, but during treatments, it can be. Um, and it always has to be in, uh, done in respect to your blood counts. So if your, your platelets are really low, um, flossing can be an issue if you cause tissue trauma that you could have uncontrolled bleeding. Um, if your white blood cell counts are really low and you cut up into the tissue, that can be uh, a concern there also. So it's very important that you use the proper technique. And I'll just show you uh, quickly here. Ideally, you want to take about 18 inches of floss. And I usually take too much, but you'd rather take too much rather than too little. And then wind it around your uh, middle finger of one side, just once or twice on that side and then all of the rest are on the middle finger of the other side. And that's gonna give you your pointer fingers and your thumbs as extensions in there. And anything you can do to fulcrum yourself, you're gonna have a lot better control versus if you're out like this. This is a lot of times where I'll see people where they will push and then they'll slip and they'll jam it up into their gum tissue. Um, so once you get it in between your teeth, just like in that bottom picture there, you actually wanna take the floss and curve it against one of the teeth real tight, like in a C shape. And you can go back and forth a bit, but you ideally wanna take that floss in an up and down motion that you are scrubbing that whole inside edge of that one tooth. And as long as you're curving it real tight, you'll slide into that pocket that I was mentioning um, in the beginning where we do the probe reading. You get up into that pocket and you will uh, pull out any bacteria or food or anything <laughs> that might clog up in those areas. Then flip it over to the other side and do the same before you pull it out. And then just once you use that area, wind the used stuff around and make sure you're just using a fresh, clean spot. And that's the value of taking a longer, longer um, string of floss for that area. So you just wanna keep that same um, technique as you go along. If your blood counts are too low though, uh, your doctors may prefer that you don't go underneath the gum line. Uh, and that is just one way to help prevent any 
um, uncontrolled bleeding or problems with uh, tissue trauma. And there are a lot of options for cleaning in between the teeth. Also, there are um, some little soft, um, soft devices that you can use up in between the teeth. The water picks are great for kind of flushing through there. The biggest thing is cleaning without um, causing injury. That is the biggest thing to keep in mind. So when you look at your products, um, there are certain, especially toothpaste that contain uh, detergents that can be irritating to the tissue. Uh, that is one thing that I noticed through um, many years of working in the dental field. I, if I would have patients that would come in that had a lot of problems with like canker sores and things like that, the first thing I would ask is what kind of toothpaste are you using? And if it has the detergent in there called sodium lauryl sulfate. Um, so sodium lauryl sulfate is a detergent that's found in toothpaste, in laundry detergents, in bath soaps, um, dishwashing liquids, all those types of things that help to give it that nice sudsy feeling. Uh, so they do add it into toothpaste because it helps to give it a nice texture. It really makes you feel like you're, you're cleaning really well. The only thing is they found that it can for some people be a, a, a skin or tissue irritant. Uh, for somebody who is likely to experience some issues with oral mucositis, using products with sodium lauryl sulfate can be something that kind of pushes them over the edge with having problems. So it's good to avoid that during treatments. Um, there is also one that is not seen as frequently um, that's called cocobitopropyl betaine. It's a mouthful. Um, but for some people also, they have found it to be um, a tissue irritant and so much so that a, uh, the Contact Dermatitis Society gave it a goofy award back in 2004 as allergen of the year. And they found that the vast majority of people that have reactions to it did um, experience them in the head and neck region. So especially for your toothpaste, look for those and finding something that says free of irritating detergents like sodium lauryl sulfate is a good idea. Um, also using caution with other um, ingredients like that can be drying to the tissue and can be irritating. Um, alcohol, phenol, peroxide, tartar control, whitening, and also strong flavors. Um, sometimes the sharp peppermint or cinnamon can be far too irritating for tender tissue. And that may also be something that can be um, a problem if nausea is an issue. Uh, some people actually have success using a child's flavor like a bubble gum or a berry flavored or something like that. It might um, be a little more gentle for them. So going back to the, the concept about how our, our saliva helps to keep a, a good pH in the mouth. Uh, so if you look at that pH scale, neutral is considered your, your seven and anything in the lower numbers is showing an acidic level. Anything in higher is showing alkaline. So a healthy mouth is right around that seven range. And when you start to have the acidic, um, that is when people are more susceptible to cavities, to damage to their enamel. So the, the bad bacteria that cause these issues um, thrive in that acidic environment. And so the more acidic it is, the more bad bacteria you're gonna have that overpower the good bacteria. And a dry mouth by nature is an acidic mouth. Um, we need those buffers in our in healthy saliva to help raise it up into that seven range. So basically what happens is every time we eat or drink, our mouth goes what they call is like an acid attack occurs. So we'll eat or drink something and for the next 20, 30, 40 minutes, um, that whole pH of the mouth plummets down into that more acidic range. And then those natural buffers of our saliva will wash in and then they will bring it back up into that healthy seven range. So that is a reason why people who have dry mouth, they never are able to kind of rebound in to that healthier um, pH range. They stay kind of hovering in that acidic range. And that's why people who uh, have dry mouth are so much more susceptible to getting cavities and have problems with that. So knowing that it's very frightening um, how many products there are in the market that are acidic. And some of them are actively uh, marketed to um, patients with dry mouth. They are actively marketed to people going through treatments. Um, and this is showing an, in 2018, there was a study out of Florida where they tested 11 dry mouth lozenges. And out of the 11, they only found that two 
were in a safe range that they would not contribute to damaging teeth. So if you look at some of these ranges on there, when you're looking at a, like a 2.9, a 3.1, that's around the same type of a pH as a diet soda. So um, if somebody's using these on a regular basis, they unfortunately are probably contributing to having uh, more damage done to their teeth. Uh, the only two that the study found that were in a safer range into that more alkaline range to help balance it out were the xylem melts and the sallies. And this is a list of um, pH of uh, many different uh, common mouth rinses. And so when you look at that too, they have that line there where the neutral is seven and everything in a higher range is considered you know, healthier as far as keeping a, a better pH in the mouth. Uh, but when you look down on that other um, section on the bottom, again, going down to a 3.3, uh, that is around about a, a soda. So uh, there's quite a range for some of these. And, and one of the reasons that a lot of dry mouth products are acidic is because that acidity um, helps to stimulate some saliva flow, but using it on a regular basis, obviously that, that could really cause an issue after a time. Um, something else we could look at is the type of sweetener that's um, in your products. And there are some sweeteners that can actually help protect your teeth. Uh, one of them that you may be familiar with is called xylitol. It is a natural uh, sugar substitute that's made out of fibrous materials like uh, corn cobs and birch trees. And how it works is that even though it looks like sugar and it tastes like sugar, its carbon structure is different. So those bad bacteria uh, that I keep referring to that eat the sugar that we eat to cause the acid, they can't digest this. Uh, so with regular use, and they consider it uh, kind of the sweet spot of five exposures a day, um, those bacteria essentially start starving and it cuts down on those types of, of um, problems inside of the mouth. It does help to stimulate saliva because it has a sweet taste. Uh, but then you, it is digest as the fiber. So for somebody that's never used xylitol products, you want to introduce it slowly into your routine and it gives your body a chance to adjust to it. If you would go from no xylitol products to using a bunch of them, um, some people may have some stomach um, irritation with it at first. Uh, it has a very low glycemic index, so it's safe for diabetics, uh, but just like, um, grapes and raisins and chocolate is fine for us, but not for our dogs. Um, same thing with xylitol. You wanna keep it away from your dogs because they cannot digest it. Um, another one that is going to be, I believe, more commonly used coming up there is erythritol. Um, that does not carry as many um, issues as far as digestive problems. It's not as big of an issue for dogs. Um, it is just, I believe, a little bit more expensive to manufacture at this point. Uh, so it's just not as commonly seen, but I think we will be seeing more of that. Uh, so with five exposures a day, that sounds intimidating, but uh, rather than having to add five extra things to your day, you can actually just substitute. Um, it comes in, you know, different products that you're using. It comes in gums, it comes in mints, candies, um, dry mouth sprays, gels, toothpaste, mouth rinses, pretty much anything. So you can get those exposures pretty easy. Uh, there's also the recommendation for using bland uh, rinses that you can make at home. And, and there are different recipes for this, but they're the, the salt and baking soda rinses. Uh, for this one, uh, this particular recipe I got from the International Society of Oral Oncology, and they recommend a level teaspoon of salt with a level teaspoon of baking soda with four cups of water, and you put it in a covered container and just mix it up real well. And you can risk, rinse with that as many times as you want throughout the day. Uh, the baking soda can help to um, neutralize any acids in your mouth. Um, it helps to rinse away any food debris or prob, you know, things that are catching around there. And then also the salt can help to reduce um, inflammation in the tissue. If you do have active mouth sores, uh, you may want to cut back on the salt thing. Just um, you can kind of play with that if you feel like that's irritating at all. But at the end of the day, you just dump out whatever's left over and you mix a fresh batch for the next day then. And then also talking with your doctors and your, um, your dentist about fluoride. Uh, fluorides are so valuable for protecting your teeth against, um, against cavities, against sensitivity. And there's a difference between the topical fluoride where you're actually applying it to your teeth versus fluoride that is considered systemic where you would get in your drinking water. Um, the systemic fluoride 
is more beneficial to children as your teeth are forming. And that way, as they're drinking it, it helps their teeth actually form um, more resistant to decay. Uh, once you're an adult and your teeth are all there, you're gonna have much better um, results and more protection with the, the topical fluoride that's added uh, applied to your teeth. And there are over-the-counter fluorides that you can get. I mean, most oral care products have fluoride in them. Uh, and that's just at a lower concentration versus a prescription strength. So you can get um, higher concentrations through your dentist. There's a, an option of trays where they can actually take impressions of your teeth and they form trays that are specific to you. So you don't have as many issues with things rubbing onto your gum tissue or causing irritation. And that would involve basically just taking a little thin ribbon of the fluoride, putting the trays in for about five minutes a day. And, and that's pretty much all there is to it. But um, that has to be, um, if you start that early, that's great. It's just with the understanding that sometimes if the tissue gets irritated enough during treatments, uh, you may want to just go back to brushing it on um, until you're able to use it again and go back to the trays again. Uh, and then there's option of fluoride varnishes and that's what the bottom picture is. And fluoride varnishes are really handy. There's a little jelly and they paint it on at your dental um, visit and nurses many, in many states can do that too. Uh, it's a tiny little tooth or a paintbrush. They paint it on and when it mixes with your saliva, it hardens. Uh, so for about the first day or so, it feels like you've got something stuck on your teeth. But as long as that's sticking on there, it just keeps soaking up into your teeth and helping to protect it. And it's super simple and um, very beneficial for your teeth. More beneficial ingredients that you can look for in products are the addition of calcium, of phosphate, and those are uh, natural elements of healthy saliva that help to remineralize our teeth. So that those are awesome. Um, Chitosan is something that is comes from the shells of shellfish that they found to have some dental benefits um, with healing and um, for maintaining a stable pH. And the same thing with arginine. Arginine is a, a natural substance that helps to feed the good bacteria in our mouth. So rather using arginine is a neat concept because for so many years, they kept thinking about, okay, there's the bad bacteria, we're gonna concentrate on killing the bad bacteria. Well, sometimes when they concentrate on killing the bad bacteria, they kill the good bacteria too by accident. And then you don't get as great of a, an effect with that. So if you use arginine in products, you're actually feeding the good bacteria so they can outpower the bad. So it's just a, a different way of looking at it, but can give you a nice results. So uh, we're wrapping it up here soon, but don't wait until it hurts. So why it's important to see your, your dentist and hygienist regular is really to get in there and remove uh, plaque, tartar deposits, anything that may cause irritation um, or help to um, contribute to problems inside of the mouth. Uh, finding cavities early, uh, checking for potential future problems, obviously x-rays so that we can find things as early as possible. Uh, we're gonna help to prevent infections, doing preventive treatments with fluoride, uh, proper home care instructions, and then oral cancer screenings. It's important that everybody have a thorough oral cancer screening um, at least once a year. Oral cancers are on the rise. I am um, on the Dental Hygiene Advisory Board for the Oral Cancer Foundation. And um, this is something that we're really promoting that people um, talk to your dental practice about it. Make sure that they are doing not only a visual screening, that, but they are feeling that they're checking for lumps or bumps. They're feeling around your cheeks, they're pulling your tongue out, looking at the back sides of your tissue. And there is a really neat um, website called checkyourmouth.org that the Oral Cancer Foundation put together, and it will lead you through how to do your own oral cancer examination. And it's a, it's a neat concept because, you know, we're taught to look for moles on our skin. We're taught to, you know, do a breast examination, but most people are not taught of what to look for inside of their mouth. And unfortunately, that is one reason that so many oral cancers are found in late stages is because people are not understanding that if there's a, something they're noticing, what is normal and what is not. So um, I would definitely encourage you to check that website out. And then to be aware that if you do have a port in to discuss with your doctor, um, if you would um, need to take an antibiotic prior to having any dental treatment done. Um, it is just very individual according to the philosophy of the doctor of the treatment center. As far as I have read ever that there's no proof that having a port in place would put you at a higher risk for developing an infection around it. Um, but for some, depending on what your full medical condition is, they may like to 
err on the side of caution and make sure that you have um, just extra protection, that there wouldn't be an issue if you're having dental care because that bacteria in your mouth can get introduced in your bloodstream and sometimes um, put people at higher risk for different types of infection. So the biggest things to think when you when to seek a dental professional's opinion, um, when you're looking in your mouth, look for dark discolorations, holes, broken or chipped teeth, anything that's sharp, uh, loose teeth or food traps um, in the tissue. You wanna look for swelling, anything that looks like a pimple or drainage, uh, white or red discolorations, lumps, bumps or thickening of the tissue, um, any uh, unusual bleeding that um, persists, sores that don't heal within two weeks. Uh, our mouths are very prone to trauma, whether it be food trauma, toothbrush trauma, biting our cheeks. Um, the rule of thumb is if something occurs inside of your mouth as far as a sore, it should be gone within two weeks. Um, if it does not go away in two weeks, that's when it should be evaluated further. And also any type of exposed bone. So looking back at, at the website, if you go to the, the blog section, this is showing like um, in the professional section, just how you can search for topics um, in the filter by area. And then there is um, one of the things that I wanted to do is put a, a small shop section on there that would allow me to go through and kind of vet different products. Um, I, I know when I go to a store, sometimes I'll see people just staring at the wall of oral care products with this glazed look in their eyes. There's so many and they're changing all the time. It's so hard to keep on top of things because sometimes you have um, a brand that will, um, they'll keep the same name, but they'll change the formulation or maybe they'll keep the same formulation, but they change the name. So it, it's hard enough um, for somebody that works in the dental field to stay on top of this. So this is something that I just tried to make an easy option of things that you can look for and explanations of what, what they are. Um, I also have um, access to a couple prescription products for dry mouth and mouth sores. And then one of the things that I added, which I'm, I'm really proud about, is if you go to the website, if you have a dental question and um, you want to speak with a dental professional about it, you can actually access teledentistry services 24-7, 365 days a year directly from the website. And that allows a second opinion. It allows uh, possibly if there is a, a concern with infection or something like that to avoid an emergency room visit, um, they can write a prescription, things like that. And so it just is one extra service um, to help give people the, the help they need. And especially if they're in treatments and it's unsafe for them to be seen um, in person at that time, it gives them another option. So you can find the yeah, informational articles um, obviously doing the support group presentations. And I do also have presentations for healthcare providers to hopefully get us as uh, providers more on the same page with medical and dental, the um, products, dental consultations. And I just added a partner's marketplace that's going to expand into um, other types of services and products that I personally can't um, offer for patients uh, or for, for, for professionals, but gives them an access to it. And then obviously the, the uh, brochure that I had mentioned too, that you can download and print for free as needed. So this is my contact information. And I invite any of you, if you, you know, come up with questions after you go home and, you know, you, you think about more things about this and you want to explore other, um, other advice or things like that, never hesitate, please, to reach out to me. I, I am the one that answers all of these and, and goes through all the information, and I'm more than happy uh, to do that. So uh, I thank you for your time, and I know I get kind of excited and <laughs> rattling off a lot of information, but are there any questions so far that Yes, there actually are a few. And thank you so much, Jill. This was really, really informative and so much information and so relevant. Um, I'll go through some of the questions that we have in the chat and then people can chime in anything else. Someone is asking, um, is chewing sugar-free gum helpful with mouth dryness? Yes, definitely. Um, that is that the chewing motion, um, you know, helps to stimulate saliva. And then definitely wanting to stick with the sugar-free. And that's one of the, um, the things that we talked about, the xylitol. If you chew the sugar-free xylitol gum, that can help to not only stimulate the saliva, but then give you that benefit of protecting against the cavities. Um, that is something, though, when you're looking at your xylitol gum, you want it to be 100% um, sweetened with xylitol 
or if they add something, it would be the erythritol. Sometimes you'll look at, and I don't want to mention any brand names probably, but if, um, like if I go look at the store, sometimes they'll say, oh, now sweetened with xylitol. And if you look at the package, it's maybe like the third sweetener down on the list. You're not going to get as much protection as far as the benefit of the xylitol versus if it's number one and 100% sweetened with the xylitol. That's great. Um, someone's asking about electric toothbrushes. Oh, good question, because I actually have one here too. <laughs> um, so this, electric toothbrushes are great. Um, the same things I would say that you want to look for is a nice compact head with really soft bristles and something that has um, multiple modes as far as the intensity, because some of them are really intense um, and that might be just a little too um, aggressive for people during the treatment process. But I think they're very valuable, especially if there's some that have like a two minute timer on there to make sure that you're brushing long enough. Um, this particular one too, it has a couple different modes on it for like sensitivity modes. So you don't have to have that, that intensity. But for this one too, if, I don't know if you can hear that at all, but if I put too much pressure on it, it actually like stops it from vibrating. So it's a, a safeguard that if people are real heavy handed that they can't get in there and, you know, <laughs> cause that is one thing you always want to use very gentle, gentle strokes. You know, you don't want to get in there and scrub brush. Um, and I, I remember when I was little, they would say, get a, you know, get a hard bristle brush and really scrub it. It just ends up damaging the tissue. You can clean just as well with soft bristles and very gentle strokes and help uh, avoid the trauma. So the same type of a concept with the electric brushes that you'd want to use. Uh, somebody else is asking, is there a mouth rinse that you recommend for an irritated tongue? Um, that is, there's a few different ones out there. It, I know the, um, the prescription saliva max, um, one that I just showed the, the one picture from my website, that is an option. Um, but then the biggest thing you probably want to do is just, again, look for that it doesn't have alcohol, it doesn't have phenol, it doesn't have peroxide, any of those irritating types of ingredients like that. Um, there, are, there are some that, um, a real mild flavor. Um, I personally like the ones that I had put on my site. I, I like the closest rinses. Those are nice and gentle. Um, there are... It's, it's very individual though. That is one thing I have to say when it comes to the symptom part of it, as far as finding what um, is the least irritating to you, finding out what helps with the dry mouth as much, especially the dry mouth. It's a little bit of trial and error for people. Unfortunately, there's, there's, uh, that is one thing that I've never found this magic bullet that seems like it's just great for everybody. Um, sometimes it's just doing a little experience to say, okay, this is working really well for me right now. And then understanding that sometimes that it can even change depending on where you are in your treatment process as your body chemistry changes, as your medications change, as things like that. So sometimes just um, doing some playing around to see what works best for you. But um, the ones that I found and even the, um, the salt water and baking soda rinse may be real beneficial for somebody having an irritated tongue. Uh, there is a request for you to put your um, your website and contact information in the chat. And if you don't mind while you're doing that, we'll see if anybody else has any questions that weren't put in the chat. Um, if you have anything else that you'd like Jill to answer, you can just unmute yourself and chime in or raise your hand or use the hand raising feature. That's great. Uh, everyone who's looking in the chat right now, you can see Jill's uh, website and her email address. Thank you so much for making yourself available. Thank you, Joe. Any other questions, anyone? This was really information dense and so incredibly helpful. I think that every single person, no matter where they're at in their um, treatment, you know, in their cancer journey, and you know, even as the staff member here, I feel like I learned so much really helpful, really interesting information that. Thank you. It's, it's definitely where my passion is and I'm always I'm happy to answer any questions, talk about it more. And, and if there's benefits for, you know, discussions with your, um, your care providers, with your, with your dental practices, things like that, I, I'd be more than happy. That's really, really helpful. Thank you so much, Jill. You know, hearing your personal experience and also how you came to have this area of specialty was really interesting. The fact that, um, 
you know, you had your own experience with your mom and then you decided to um, kind of pursue this as your, your niche um, is just so helpful to the cancer community. We feel very, very lucky to have connected with you. So thank you so, so much for taking the time with us this morning to share your passion, to share your knowledge, to share your interests. Um, it was really, really um, wonderful and a treat for all. And thank you. We had excellent, excellent attendance as we suspected um, for this topic. So um, some people did have to jump off right at noon. Um, but for those of you who are still here, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Um, and thank you again to Jill for making yourself so available even after this uh, to be able to answer questions and as a, an ongoing resource. So um, thank you for being part of Woman to Woman with us this morning and always um, have a good weekend, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you. We'll be circulating the August calendar shortly. And thank you all so much. Jill, have a great day. And it was an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.